Well, we are looking at John's Gospel on a Sunday morning, and uh, we've reached chapter 5. In the early part of that chapter, <clears throat> our Lord had been performing a tremendous miracle, curing a man who had been unable to walk for 38 years. But instead of the Jews congratulating him for doing such a wonderful miracle, they set themselves against him. Indeed, at the end of the 18th verse, we're told the Jews sought to kill him, for he told them that he was equal with the Father in heaven, and that made them very angry. Our Lord also told them that they should honour him, the Son of God, in the same way as they honoured God the Father, but that made them even more angry. And then finally he explained to them that he himself would be the judge of all men and women, and that one day the dead would hear his voice and would be raised up again. Those who'd done good would go to the resurrection of life, <clears throat> and those who'd done evil would go to the resurrection of damnation. Now the Apostle John, who wrote this Gospel, was very concerned to make it clear to all his readers that Christ was indeed God in the flesh. And he's got a lot to say about this, not just in this Gospel, but in the epistles that he wrote, which are near the end of the Bible, and even more so in the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, which John also wrote. You see, when people looked at Christ, in many ways he appeared just to be an ordinary man. He'd been born and brought up in very humble surroundings. <clears throat> He'd mixed with poor people all the time. And he was despised and rejected of men. And later on, he would be put to death in a terrible way. And the Apostle John had been a witness of these things. And as he got older, he found himself eventually the only apostle left. All the others had died, and he was the only one that was left. And all around him there were these false teachers denying that Christ was divine. And so John decided to put down on record about the wonder of Christ and his equality with his father before he himself died. <coughs> And the Holy Spirit moved upon him to write down an inspired account of the glories of the Son of God. And that's what we see in these latter verses of chapter 5. Now you may remember I told you last week that uh, most of this chapter contains only the words of Christ. Not what he did, but what he said. And that's usually a more difficult part of the scripture. Some of it's very deep. And it needs our total concentration to understand it. So from verse 31 of this chapter to the end, every word is the word of Christ. This is all him speaking, and he's speaking about himself. <clears throat> he says to these people in verse 31, that if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. He's referring here to the law that had always been in existence in the land of Israel, given by God himself through Moses. That you couldn't accept something as just the word from one witness. You had to have at least two witnesses. And although, of course, the witness of the Son of God himself would have been sufficient, for he was the truth, he was the way, the truth, and the life. Nevertheless, in order to make allowances for man's lack of understanding and hardness of heart, he is stating here that there are... Uh, there are different ways that people should uh, accept his witness. He's saying there are other people and other things that witness to his deity apart from what he was saying about himself. And therefore these other things would leave people without excuse if they would not accept him. Now the first of these other witnesses is John the Baptist. He says in verse 32, there is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that his witness is true. The witness that he witnesses of me is true. And we've already seen in this Gospel that John the Baptist was a herald of Christ. He pointed people to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And John was constantly telling people that he himself was not the Messiah, but that Jesus was. He spoke of the Lord as being the Son of God who was preferred before him. And when the Jews sent representatives to John, he bare witness to this truth. 
Never once did John try to take the limelight away from Christ. It was to his credit that Jesus says of him, here in verse 33, he bear witness unto the truth. You see, there's not many people of that, that could be said about. If we think of our own day, we would have to admit that there are very few people of whom these words could be said, that it was their great desire in life to bear witness to the truth and to point people to Christ. This world is not only an evil place, it's an untruthful place. So many lies are being told all the time. So many lies are being taught in schools and colleges and universities. So many lies are being told in the courts of law. So many lies are being told regarding the business life. So many lies are being told on television. So many lies are being told in false religion. And we would have to accept the fact that so many lies are being taught in some churches. One of the greatest lies of our day is evolution. That says that there is no God, that the world made itself, and that everything in it just happens to be going by chance. And there are millions of people who believe that lie. But who is bearing witness to the truth? Hopefully those who truly love God, they do, and certainly John the Baptist did. In verse 34, our Lord says, But I receive not testimony from man, I'm simply telling you these things that you might be saved. You see, Christ didn't need John's testimony. He didn't need John to encourage him like we need other Christians to encourage us. John had warned people to flee from the wrath to come. He told people that they needed to be saved. And you notice that our Lord actually uses that word saved here. These things have been said that you might be saved. And of course, the name Jesus means Saviour. And so before I can go on, I must ask each one of us, are you saved? I'm not asking you what you believe or what sort of life you live or why you're listening into these meetings. Are you saved? Are you saved from your sins? Are you saved from the wrath to come? Because if you're not saved, when you die, you'll be eternally lost. Now it's at this point that Jesus bears witness to John in verse 35. Our Lord has made us all this promise that if we confess him before man, he will confess us before his Father in heaven. And John had been faithful in confessing Christ before men, so now Christ speaks well of him. John was a burning and a shining light, he says. All Christians are lights in this world, God has made us so. He's enlightened us to the truth about life so that we are lights. But we're not necessarily a burning and shining light. Not all Christians shine. That's why our Lord told us not to hide our light under a bushel. But, did, but John did shine. He was a shining light. He stood up for Christ. He stood up for truth and righteousness even though in the end it was to cost him his life. Are you a shining light? How long would a person have to know you before they found out that you were a Christian? Do you shine for Jesus in the place where you work or go to school? Do you shine for him in your own home? Jesus bids us shine with a pure, clear light, like a little candle burning in the night, in this world of darkness, surely you must shine, you in your small corner and I in mine. Yes, John was a shining light, but more than that, he was a burning light. And that means that he kept going. He wasn't a flickering light. It wasn't on the way out. He was burning, burning brightly. And as this world gets darker and darker, and all sorts of evils are increasing, and midnight is approaching. Could it be said of you and I that we are burning lights in this dark world? That our light is burning as strongly now as it used to? And if you're not burning as brightly as you used to, do you know why that is? Is your light being dampened down by worldliness or laziness or unbelief or spiritual apathy? Could it be that 
while you've been in this lockdown situation where it's not been possible to come to as many church meetings as we used to, that you've got used to that. You're now in a rut and you're not burning as brightly as you used to. I'm sure most of us know the warning contained in Christ's parable about the five foolish virgins. So their lamps were gradually going out. They were not ready when the bridegroom came. So our prayer must be that, that of the old chorus, give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning. And our Lord adds the fact here that these people were willing to rejoice in John's light, but only for a season. You see, John's preaching brought light to people and some of them understood it and believed it and enjoyed it. They rejoiced in it, but it didn't last. It was only for a season. They were the typical stony ground hearers who received the word with joy, but who only lasted until they found out that the cost was too great for them to live the Christian life. And there have been so many of these people who rejoiced in the light for a season. We've had lots of them in our own church. They loved the things of God for a time, but after a while they began to realise more and more that if they continued on in the Christian life, it was going to cost them something, particularly regarding their time. And also regarding the high standards that God expects his people to live. It was rather like what our Lord Jesus said in another gospel, that it's only those who endure to the end that shall be saved. The endurance is not a means of salvation, it's the evidence of salvation. It shows a person not just rejoicing in the light for a season, but for their whole life. <clears throat> John was a great preacher, second only to the Lord Jesus. He was a burning and a shining light, yet even he couldn't keep these people interested, he couldn't keep these people going, for stony ground believers would eventually depart no matter how good the ministry is that they receive. They were willing for a season, but then they were not willing anymore. Again, you know, these days in which we live are a season, it's something special. It'll be looked back in the years to come. People say, do you remember those days when that terrible disease was on the earth? And it might just be that there are people who are listening on live streaming and so on who didn't used to listen before this season, but now they do. And when this season is over, when all this trouble is gone, uh, they'll be gone. I hope you're not going to be one of those. Now, verse 36 Christ comes on to something else that was a witness to him. Indeed, he said that this is a greater witness than that of John. And he's speaking here about his tremendous miracles that he'd performed, which he describes here as the works which his father had given him to do. He cured the sick, he healed the lame, he gave sight to the blind and speech to the dumb and hearing to the deaf, he even raised the dead. He walked on water, he stilled the storm. And on the very occasion that he's now speaking, he'd cured that man who'd been ill for 38 years. And these tremendous miracles testified to who he was. They witnessed to everybody with an open mind that he must have been more than just a man. He must have been divine. His miracles were not only great, but many and done in public. And his enemies scrutinised each one of them, but they couldn't find anything against them. Indeed, in the great miracle of the raising of Lazarus from death, you may remember that his enemies wanted to put Lazarus to death again. They wanted to kill Lazarus, not kill Christ, kill Lazarus, so that they could try and pretend that the miracle had never happened. And what is more, Christ's miracles benefited people. Their cures lasted. And many people could see in their own bodies that Christ must have been divine. And then in verse 37, our Lord speaks about God the Father being another witness to him. Firstly, God has sent prophets throughout the days of the Old Testament who prophesied of Christ many years before he came. People like Micah who prophesied 500 years before Jesus came that he would be born in Bethlehem, 500 years before it happened. That bore testimony to Christ. And then there was the occasion at Christ's baptism, 
when God the Father spoke out loud and said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this also happened again later on when Christ was transfigured, when God himself spoke once more, this is my beloved Son, hear him. But our Lord says here, you have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape, for God is invisible and was hardly ever seen in any way throughout the Old Testament. As we saw back in the fourth chapter, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. But what our Saviour is mainly saying here about the fact that these people hadn't heard the voice of God seems to be speaking about the fact that they didn't recognise the voice of God. Because that's borne out in the next verse, verse 38, where he says, you have not God's word abiding in you. The fact that these people had refused to hear God's voice and turned a deaf ear to him was another reason why they didn't believe in Christ nor accept him as their Messiah, which is what he says at the end of this verse. They had heard the gospel, they knew what God's word said, they, but they hadn't received it, so it didn't abide in them, it didn't affect their lives. If they had have received it, then they would have received Christ as their saviour, but they didn't. They rejected him. They pretended that they loved God, but their attitude towards God's Son showed that they didn't love God. And it's always been the case since that men and women have shown their opposition to God by their rejection of his Son. Now in verse 39, our Lord gives the next thing which bore testimony to him, and that was the scriptures. And for us who live 2,000 years later, perhaps that's the most important. John has been long since dead. The miracles only took place within a three-year time span. But the scriptures are still with us. But our Lord must have been referring to the Old Testament scriptures because the New Testament scriptures weren't written at that time. And we today are so greatly blessed that we have both the Old Testament and the New Testament, and they all speak about Christ. And here our Lord links the matter of eternal life with searching the Scriptures. And what he seems to be saying is two things. Firstly, that the Jews did read the Scriptures and believed that they gave guidance regarding the matter of eternal life, but they'd failed to see Christ in those Scriptures. God's Word testified of him, but they didn't realise it. But it was as if they read the scriptures with a blindfold over their eyes. The Old Testament scriptures testified of Christ, but they couldn't see him. And of course these words are very applicable to our own day and age, where there are people who go to church and don't just read the Bible, they own a Bible themselves, but they tend to leave out the Old Testament on one side not realising that they are they which testify of Christ. There's so much about our Lord in the Old Testament that either people don't realise it or they're not prepared to search for it because that's the second thing that the Lord says here, that people should search the Scriptures. Indeed, it's almost like a command, isn't it? Search the Scriptures, something you ought to do, search the Scriptures. The word is search, not read, or even study, but search the scriptures. And this is why all those churches which are faithful to God's word will have Bible studies. For that is a way to search the scriptures in obedience to what Christ says. Those people who don't search the scriptures are missing out a great deal from what he says. And the way this verse is written, and the way Christ spoke about it, using the word they twice, and they are they which testify of me, he's indicating that the Holy Scriptures are the only writings that testify of him. The Scriptures alone are they that tell us about his life and his teaching and his miracles and his death. There's no other true record of the, of the life of Christ. And so, John the Baptist, the miracles, God the Father and the Scriptures all testified of Christ. But still these people wouldn't accept him. As our Lord says in verse 40, 
You will not come to me that you may have life. And that word will there is important. You will not come. What he's saying is this. It wasn't lack of evidence that kept them in their sins. It was lack of desire. They didn't will it. They didn't want Christ. And such is the case today. The Lord Jesus Christ stands ready to receive all those who truly come to him, but hardly anybody will come to him. People don't see their need of him. People don't feel any guilt. They don't believe in a judgment to come. And above all, they don't want to live the Christian life. If they did come to Christ, they would receive eternal life but they will not come that they might have life. How often has a Christian explained the gospel to somebody and they've seen the truth of it, but the last thing they would ever think of doing is becoming a true Christian. In verse 41, Christ says quite simply, I receive not honour from men. In other words, he was not seeking any compliments from people. He knew that he, he was... Uh, the son of God, he didn't need anybody to pat him on the back, he wasn't out to win any applause, he wanted people to accept him for their own sake and not for his sake. His desire was to please his father, not men and women, and so it should be with those who serve him. We're not to seek honour from men and women, but from God. Our Lord is very straight with these people in verse 42. He says, I know you that you have not the love of God in you. In the sight of other people, these Jews often appeared very religious, but in reality they had no love for God. But how important are these words, I know you. You see, you've got to know somebody really well before you can know whether they really love God. If you belong to a church which only meets together on a Sunday, you never know the people there very well and you'll probably think that they all love God quite a bit. But what, what is a person like when you really get to know them? What are they like at home? What are they like at work? What are they like when they drive a motor car? What are they like when they're sitting in front of the television? Or when something nasty is said to them? Or when they're feeling ill? Or when they can't get their own way? What are they like then? For that's when you know how much they really love God. Sadly, it's a fact of life that the people we know the least, we tend to esteem the most. But Christ makes it plain here that he knows everybody and can see whether they love God or not. Now verse 43 is a very solemn verse. Our Lord tells these people that they wouldn't accept him even though he came from God with all authority, whereas they would accept somebody else who was a nobody and who had no authority. The Jews had all these testimonies to Christ, yet they wouldn't accept what John the Baptist said or what the Old Testament said or what the miracles of Christ said. But somebody else who got none of this, got no proof at all as to who they were, they would accept. Showing yet again that it's not proof that people want. They simply don't want Christ and the Christian way of life. Back to evolution again, huh? isn't it? And those who proclaim it. It's absolute nonsense. When you think about it, it's absolute nonsense. But millions of people believe that. They believe what they're being told. But they won't believe the words of Christ. Our Lord also makes it clear here that true believers have the distinguishing mark that they are far more concerned as to what God thinks about them than what people think about them. In fact, he says in verse 44, how can you believe if you're more concerned with what your companions think about you than you are in what God thinks about you? And I think these words sum up our nation in the 21st century where so much has been said about celebrities entertainers, footballers, film stars and so on, and where people are seeking to receive honour from one another, and where young people would love to be in that position, they say, I'd like to be like that when I grow up. But hardly anybody is seeking that honour which comes from God. Have you noticed recently 
on the news has been famous people dying. Almost every week there's some famous person who's died. And when they stand before God in judgment, they won't have their fans and their followers with them. They may have been rich on the earth, but they're not rich towards God. And notice the word only at the end of verse 44. That could have been left out quite easily. It's as if the only honour we should be seeking is that which comes from God. Oh yes, it's nice to have friends and companions and people around you who love, love you. It's marvellous and great to have somebody who really loves you. That's what Christian fellowship is for. But it's not the high opinion of others that we should be seeking. We should be seeking the high opinion of God. These Jews were, were honouring, they were honouring others in the sense that they only ever said nice things about each other. They never spoke to one another about their sins or their failings or the truth. Hence there was never any repentance among them. You get a, a group of ungodly people together and they're saying nice things about each other. They're not going to tell each other the truth. They, they don't want the truth. They're not like that. Men and women will never come to Christ while they're still thinking well of themselves. It's only when they see their sinfulness that they will come for forgiveness of the Saviour. In verse 45, our Saviour explains to these Jews that although they thought that they were God's special people based on the writings of Moses, Moses did in fact condemn them by what he had written. They trusted in Moses, yet our Lord says that Moses would accuse them. You see, it was Moses who God used to give us the Ten Commandments. That's the law of God, and that condemns everybody. And the Ten Commandments is the law and the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. When we see how bad we are, we feel well, we, we need a saviour, it, it brings us to Christ. In a sense, Moses was the schoolmaster, saying, look, this is how, how uh, bad you are, you need a saviour. He'd been pointing people to Christ from the beginning. Later in chapter 9, these people say, we are Moses' disciples and we know that God spoke to Moses. But by saying this, they were condemning themselves for they didn't accept what Moses taught. For as he says in the next verse, had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. The Bible tells us that Moses esteemed the reproach of Christ as greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. In other words, he preferred to take his stand with the coming Messiah and his people, even though that meant trouble for him, than to receive the riches and treasures of Egypt if he'd have stayed living in the palace. Moses' faith was in Christ. And as it says here, he wrote about him. Isn't that amazing? There's Moses at the beginning of the Old Testament, right back at the beginning. And yet he writes about Christ. And let's remember who's saying this. This is the Lord Jesus saying this. He wrote about me. So Moses wrote the first five books of the Old Testament. So we're going right back to the beginning. And there Moses wrote about Christ. And we can see clear evidence that there's no disagreement between the Old Testament and the New Testament, or between Moses and Christ. And then in the last verse, our Saviour says, if you don't believe the writings of Moses, how will you believe my words? It's almost as if he's saying, if you don't believe in the Old Testament, then you won't believe in the New Testament. Or how many people are condemned by this? All sorts of men and women say that they live by the New Testament, but they won't accept the Old Testament. But here is the Lord Jesus himself telling us that such people don't really accept the New Testament. Indeed, it is those first five books of the Old Testament that are the most rejected and hated. But you can't get away from what Jesus says here. That if you do not believe in the writings of Moses in the first five books of the Bible, you won't believe in the words of Christ either. And although many people don't want to face up to this fact, what he's telling us here is that if a person rejects the Old Testament, then they may not be one of his true uh, followers at all. 
And so throughout our passage this morning, our Lord has been showing abundant proof of his divinity. He's shown us that several things have borne testimony to him. But where does that leave each one of us this morning? Have you accepted Christ as your saviour? He's come to save you and bring you eternal life. But is he saying the, the same words to you as he said to these people in verse 40? You will not come to me that you might have life. I hope not. Ask him to come into your life and be your saviour, and he will. May God help us all to be burning and shining lights. Amen.